All right, every, every, it's going to be interesting now. So everywhere where my talk goes in a similar direction to Finn's talk, but everywhere where you were dark, I'm going to be cute and cuddly. <laughs> but I need to set up my sound first. Lights are on. Lights are on. Do you see this? All right. Um, I hope I'm loud enough. Uh, let me quickly start um, thanking Wendy for inviting me and for Lord Moore, and also the Brown University and this building for sheltering us from the weather. And um, the title, um, yeah, and for giving me the opportunity to give my talk here, um, which will be um, presenting a bit of my research that I just started about the Internet of Things. Um, and interfaces. The title, as some of you might have noticed, is stolen from W.J.T. Mitchell, who uh, wrote this essay, Looking at Animals Looking. And um, it goes in a very different direction, but animals will play a role. Becoming media, the things around us have started to address us. Our car insists stubbornly that we turn our seat belts or lights on, asks for attention when parking, as it fears its body might get scratched, screams for help when it reckons someone else it does not know wants to take it. The vacuum cleaner informs us that it is stuck and that you need to move Roomba to a new location. <laughs> you can see I have one from me <laughs> imitating it. And then there's also Siri, of course, and soon there will be many series more. As things are becoming interactive, to use their technical interfaces means to communicate with technology. Of course, we understand that it is not technology itself that has raised its head and started to speak to us. And yet Heidegger had good reason to look further than those statements. Technology is a means to an end. Technology is a human activity. Now our technological devices have started to address us with multiple voices. Whatever your take on technology is, non-human, non-human or human-made, or even inhuman, I am sure we can agree that the recent development is transforming our being with technology and with it our contemporary discourse. My talk explores this being with technology from the perspective of communication and it does it in four steps. In writing this lecture, however, um, it, <laughs> it turned out that those steps not always go forward but also sideways, so please bear with me. In the first step, I will look, oops, yeah. I will look at the theoretical take on the force of communication as well as at the particularity we find when communicating with digital media. In the second step, I will turn to my attention from theory to technology to find out how the dialogue between man and machine is initiated by digital media, how is technology addressing us. In the third step, I will look at the specific form of logic being invoked in this addressing and with this dialogue. And finally, in the fourth step, slightly going sideways, I explore the discursive concept that is to be encountered here, as I'm interested in how the force of this dialogue works. But let's start with the first step. Communication theory has always suspected that communication, and therefore media and technology, is transforming our being in this world. While there are different takes on communication, you mentioned already some. One question has always been at its heart, what force is shaping while we are communicating? What force is happening, sorry, while we are communicating? Shannon's mathematical theory of communication, for example, implies that the range of a medium, as Kitler has frequently pointed out, also defines the possibilities of meaning, thereby claiming a certain dependency from the transmitting medium. Derrida adds to this perspective that something else is going on when communication is happening by observing that communication also does not simply transmit content. Sending, iterating a message relies on its fundamental displacement. Of its meaning, one can never be certain. Raymond Williams points to a very different aspect, one more related to its aspect of communion. In his keywords, he discussed the force of communication it's a distributive act. Communication makes something common to many, 
whereby two different qualities can happen. It can be manipulative as well as participatory. Not far from this, we find the important take of Donna Haraway here with her dog, Cayenne, who has shown that technology is communicating with us also on a fairly different level. Gender and our being in this world is interwoven with technology. We are integrated. All those different takes on technology explore a force happening while we are communicating. This force is changing with digital media. More recent conversations have pointed out the specificity of digital media communication, which is twofold. Being written in code itself, it has two strands of communication, the program and the user. In other words, it has two interfaces, one for the machine and one for the user, the human. More than 10 years ago, the alert Wendy Chan wrote about this bivalence, describing software as an invisible system of visibility, quote, a functional analog to ideology, end of quote, an important point to which I will come back to later. Following her, Alex Galloway has addressed the interface as effect and ethos to make a similar point. Interfaces are not simply transmitting our messages. In their bivalence, they are op opening or enforcing a particular dialogue with technology. When discussing digital media, theorists have often differed where exactly the door to this dialogue with technology is located. Is it in the source code communicating with the hardware, or is it in the graphical user interface communicating with the user? Where is it that software studies has to look at? To make things even more complicated, we recently added a new parameter to this, data. Whenever looking at our communication with technology, this lecture, however, is interested in a very specific aspect of this dialogue. It is not looking at how we can interact with technology in order to establish a superior role for a human master in this communication. Instead, it is more interested what it means to live with technology. And as you might guess from these words, I'm coming, I'm very influenced by Gilbert Simondon. I'm very happy Gertrude already mentioned his name this morning and it's also relating to him. Um, so I'm therefore looking at the following question. How is technology addressing us? How is technology addressing us? The force of being addressed, as we all know, has famously been unveiled by Louis Althusser's theory of interpolation, which is highly influential, although it is less a theory, but rather just a paragraph in which he, with the help of a policeman, showed that being addressed is an act whereby an individual is transformed into a specific subject. And here's the quote. Um, I need to read it myself. <laughs> Ideology acts or functions in such a way that it recruits subjects among the individuals or transforms the individuals into subjects by that very precise operation which I have called interpolation or hailing. So let's tune into what's being said to us by technology as what are we being recruited when technology is addressing us as what are we recruited in this call? Um, and I show you f a few pictures to help you out. A nice cute fox, little bird, little owl. <laughs> Who remembers this? It was quite annoying. It always popped up when you wanted to write something. Then we have a cute, nice Mac designed by Susan Kerr, um, penguin. And the nice Google logo, of course. Here technology approaches us in bright colors with big typography, looking at us friendly, being cute. In short, it approaches us in an infantile way. It's a children's birthday party. The internet has created a world full of animated animals or things with friendly faces and playful scenes. We are addressed by technology as if we were children very different from the brand design of consumer goods or services, not only because several mainstream services come at the hand of a mascot. There is Twitter, Firefox, Hootsuite, and this little white alien here with an antenna. There are animals wherever you look, from Tux the penguin to the black autocad that excuse the 404 pages of GitHub. Even a non-mascot service like Facebook has a little animal, which is my current favorite. Who of you has seen this? It's a Zucker Sauer. Here you can see it in action. It tells you that you should care about your privacy settings. Um, 
What is the reason that internet services put little animals everywhere and make their world appear like we are Alice in Wonderland? Of course, one can blame this on the human tendency to anthropomorphize the world around us, and with it, the force called technology. But there's more to it. Much like Heidegger anticipating the being of gears broken, of, of gears from looking at those gears broken, what this infantilization really is and how it is related to the force of technology shows itself best where it goes a bit wrong. For example, when making rather serious topics like surveillance or privacy, looking like a funny, playful thing to deal with, nothing of importance, which is not only the case with the Zuckersauer, but also here with Google's uh, pages, a little ship that tells you how much email was encrypted in transit, it wants to make email safer, and you find this nice page where it's like uh, one of the Czech um, children books Marcel Maas showed us in his keynote. Um, Google is in fact an excellent example for this, even though Apple's brilliant user interface designer Susan Kerr needs to be credited as the one who sort of invented this mainstream approach which it has become now. Google was the company whose logo, despite several changes, which you can see here over the years, always remained the look and feel of my first search engine. Making graphic designer Peter Saville, who some of you might know from album covers like this, describing the strategy like, and I quote, everything about it is childlike, the colors, the typeface, even the name. Looking at the design of tech games for children, addressing the adult and the child, and I brought you to a couple of slides. This is a bit small, I'm afraid, but it's um, all I could find. It's an old slide of Dieter Rams. Some of you might know him from the brown alarm clock. Um, so he designed this sort of uh, tech game um, for children. And here you can see it's a very different approach. It approaches the adult and the child to learn. Um, and this is very different now. Um, Today, we can say with a colorful design, with big typography, and the general attitude of breaking down complexity, with all the friendly faces of animated animals or things that make us feel like we are in a fairy tale, we are certainly not addressed as young, reasonable persons. Online, our world looks more like this, a Fisher-Price activity center. <laughs> that this world is made suitable for children can also be seen with the Google Doodles coating the events and persons shaping human history and culture with imaginative cuteness. Until 2010, Google had sporadically changed its prominent search website logo into those doodles in order to mark an anniversary or event. On those special occasions, one could find a sketch that playfully intertwined the topic of an event with a logo. Here you see the birthday of, Brit uh, of the English mathematician Ada Lovelace. Um, but yeah, this is the Magna Carta. If we have time later, I can show you the GIF. It's fantastic. Um, Martin Luther King. After 2010, the playfulness intensified. In the years 2011 to 2012, the doodle number went up to 76 and 83 and has gone up ever since. I stopped counting them. More and more historic events were turned into fabulous stories. Today, we see them weekly. Considering that Google is now an essential part of our public sphere, Google Doodles are the monuments we find on it. As we pass by those monuments when searching, they commemorate important moments that shaped our human fate. In contrast to the historic monuments cast in stone and erected on our public squares, which foster a certain symbolism and spread an air of pathos. That's Roger Williams here. Korean War Memorial, also in Providence. The first president of the um, National Rifle Association. Martin Luther King, Washington. And I also brought you, of course, Karl Marx from Berlin. Um, but now it looks like this. The online doodle monuments are not pathetic. Instead, they turn achievements into playful stories. We are recruited by technology as very young children. So as what do we need to read this strange approach of technology? What ideology to link back to Wendy Chun? Do we find at play here? 
The way technology is communicating with us is surely not just about being amicable and nice, communicating the friendliness of cuddly Silicon Valley companies. Addressing us as very young children, it is rather suggested that the user does not need to understand. She or he just needs to try it, go press this button, speak to it, create. The black box that technology always was has become colorful, but it remains non-transparent. We don't need to understand the forces or interests that have created those bright, colorful surfaces. We don't need to worry. Everything's just playful. Certainly, this playfulness imposed on us can be addressed as manipulation. Everyone who has been disciplined by its car's navi has noticed this. Since technology has started to speak, the human tendency is to feel patronized. This has spread to our supermarkets. And I don't know if you have self-service tills here. And I brought, a cup, I brought the sound from them. Unexpected item in bagging area. Remove this item before continuing. This can now be placed in your bag. Club card accepted. All of your Tesco points add up. Please take your change. Notes are dispensed below the scanner. Please don't forget your change, especially notes. At other places, the patronization is well hidden, for example, in the looks of a sad koala. Even if the interfaces around us are doing this in a very clever way, hardly noticeable, it is still patronization. We are getting manipulated. But this is 2015, and we are already way in what will later be called the confusing complexity of the 21st century. So there's more to it. With this manipulation, something else is happening, an idea of empowerment. Making interfaces easy and playable is also a way to increase media literacy and to make the usage of new technologies attractive to users. Go experiment and intervene. In fact, this idea was essential for the evolution of graphic user interfaces in the 1970s. The third part of my talk will look at the logic being used there, and this part comes with a subheading. Logic is not a derivative of language. As nerds and digital media theorists, we know that computers have tremendously changed in the 70s. This was not only as they shrunk to the size of a coffee machine fitting on every desk, but also because their interface became graphical. Generally, we refer to the Palo Alto Research Center of Xerox, who took an important role in developing and refining it. What is less known, however, is that their computer scientists owe their approach to a Swiss developmental psychologist, to Jean Piaget. In the 60s and 70s, Piaget had researched a rather new approach towards understanding. His theory was that for human understanding and learning, not reasoning, the work of the mind, but practical and experimental understanding, the work of mind and fingers together, or the work of fingers first and then mind, however you want to take it, are central. When observing very young children between the ages of two and seven, which is as we are addressed by technology at the moment, Piaget recognized a specific way in which children play. They analyze their environment using real things that become mental symbols, which means logic is not only formed in the brain. Quote, I believe that logic is not a derivative of language. The source of logic is much more profound. It is the total coordination of actions actions of joining things together or ordering things. This is what logical, mathematical experience is. This approach was to be picked up by the computer scientists Seymour Papert and Alan Kay, whose lab we visited yesterday. For eight years until 1966, Papert had worked with Piaget at the University of Geneva, and he adapted Piaget's theory to teach children programming. Here you see them. But it was his friend and colleague, Alan Kay, who brought this approach from kids to us, the adults. An early iPad that came to be known as the Portable Educational Computer Dynabook, which was to be commanded by experimental actions. Today's infantilization of interfaces, inviting you to experiment with them, can be read as a sequence of this approach. And here, things are getting complicated. For this means, if infantilization can invite and empower and or also patronize the user, infantilization works both ways. 
It can empower the user, but it can also be used to manipulate him or her and distract from what is really going on. And here you can see um, exactly what Alan Kay put out there, a personal computer for children of all ages, is this gesture of empowering the user and empowering children. Um, so it can go both ways. Here things are getting complicated. Both ideological attitudes are an effect of infantilization, empowering and patronizing, and of course, their difference is decisive. How can one conceive this difference? How do we know if a digital interface is addressing us with the aim of empowerment or deceiving and sedating us? This is the question that marks the beginning of the end of my lecture, and with it, we enter its last part, to look at infantilization again, but this time with a different perspective, one that's looking at the discursive concept happening there, understanding a flip side. From a philosophical point of view that is curious about how power unfolds, it is tremendously interesting that infantilization is able to turn both ways, being patronizing and empowering. For this means, its differences re refrain to follow a well-behaved dialectical thinking. Hurry up. Its concepts does not unfold in an oppositional way, and this is specifically what interests me because we always moan that we live in the 21st century and we lost the other. So I'm interested to understand how can we think differences when there are multiple others. Oh, no. Anyhow, I just continue. Should, should not stop derivate from your talk. Not good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, its concept does not unfold in an oppositional way. It does not rely on an antagonism, which complicates things. Being for the user's emancipation does not equal being against infantilization. The tension here is not a dialectic one. It is more complicated, post-dialectical, so to say. And it cannot only be observed with infantilization. Sociologists have since quite some time observed the same tension, or missing tension really, when it comes to work and creativity, which became the new spirit of capitalism, while remaining something we all thrive for. The more it is important that philosophy takes a closer look at this and dissects the conceptual machine we find at work here. Because it is not that work and creativity or patronization and emancipation have become the same, the concept we encounter here is post-dialectical. Post, as a fundamental dialect, remains. There are still differences. The infantilization of an interface can potentially be emancipatory and deceptive, but it is actually whether emancipatory or deceptive. Instead of following the antagonism we know from dialectics, being for or against, we encounter a concept where one is the flip side of the other. A flip side that functions according to a different concept, at its other side is not against. Perhaps you have already noticed it. This resonates very strongly with an approach of Karen Barrett. And here I don't know if I'm now, I think I'm more glad that she couldn't come. Also at the same time, I'm really sad. <laughs> because, yeah, it's too short to really, you know, honor what she did. So, so um, Karen Barrett um, found this... Uh, um, she described it as diffraction. She developed it by looking at the physical phenomenon of the same name. I'm sure most of you are familiar with her work. Um, this is a sketch of 1803 by Thomas Young, a sketch of a two-slit diffraction, and you see it's a, is it black or is it white? You can't decide. It's a, it's a flip side, even though there are differences to be seen on the thing. It's a very simple uh, explanation. As a conceptual approach, diffraction avoids to focus on essential otherness and oppositions. Instead, it involves reading insights through one another, a process Barrett has turned into an inspiring method. But she also writes about another aspect, and this is the one I want to focus here on. Regarding diffraction, one has to attend to and respond to the fine details. This is something she wrote. Because it is how the fine details are entangled, which is making the difference, it is the how one needs to turn to. It is this aspect in her theory that I want to emphasize here as this is the only way to give an answer to the question how do we know if a digital interface is addressing us with the aim of empowerment or deceiving and sedating us. 
There is no general way of knowing, but it can be known. The devil is in the detail. But I want to put your attention also somewhere else, to a shift of our theoretical landscape, and this is where I step sideways, for instead of looking into the terms of media, I want to show you that media has changed the terms. Overall, turning to the fine details has become a habit of media theorists, as has the questioning of oppositions. It is currently to be seen in several approaches of media theorists who have analyzed technology or media to show that the discursive formations in our societies have changed their interrelations. With new media, former antagonistic word pairs like public-private, global-local, free-controlled, nature-technology, work-play, to name but a few, have changed their relation. Once understood as antithetical, today theorists point out that their conceptual relation does not seem to be essentially oppositional anymore. Tiziana Terranova has among the first who discussed the ambiguity of digital media that commenting online is free labor, but also an important force in digital capitalism, thereby remaining pleasurable, a paradox. Wendy Chan analyzed the change of free control to show that digital media is spreading democratic freedom, along with the fact that it also accelerates the potential for control and global surveillance. Turning to a very different antithetical pair, that of nature technology, Yussi Parika dissects an ideology of media, the entanglement of today's media with nature in a very poetic way. While from a philosophical perspective, that picks up computer science, Luciana Parisi has questioned today's critique of instrumental rationality, pointing out that incomputability and randomness need to be conceived as the very condition of computation, not instrumentality. One could add Nikol Staruzielski or Christopher Kelty and many more whose recent books or essays discuss how to deal with the new ambiguities and paradoxes we live with. If this is showing up in technology, and becomes visible in communication, or if this shift is the effect of technology, is not mine to answer, although it is a very interesting question, also for the positioning of the humanities and their approach to technology. For now, let's return to the beginning and end this talk. As this word is, as Jean-Luc Nancy once put it, becoming technology, things are changing. But we know that when things become medium, when they start to have an address and raise a voice and speak thereby addressing us, it is not technology we hear. Technology is, as Heidegger put it, nothing technical. There is a force happening when we are communicating, and the effect of this force is a shift. It is our discourse shifting. Familiar antagonisms are vanishing, extremes meet in a literal way, oppositions disintegrate, but differences remain. Even though they often need an analytical dissection to become visible, as we live in an overcomplex 21st century, differences are still the case, and with it the concept of the political remains in communication. And with this last step that clearly went sideways, I end my talk. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> <laughs>